Hi guys, it's John back with another model inbox review. Um, today we're looking at a Wimpy. This is the famous Vickers Armstrong Whitworth Wellington Bomber. The variant that we're actually doing an inbox review on is a Wellington Mark 10. This particular Wellington image here is a Royal Canadian Air Force B Mark III. But the Mark 10, um, it was basically just an up-engined version of this aircraft in every respect. It had more powerful engines and therefore a slightly longer range and um, it could carry a better bomb load or over a longer range which was quite useful. The, mo the model that we're looking at today is another matchbox kit. It's the, um, the Red Range PK402 Wellington B Mark 10 with three alternative squadron decal options um, and one of the options and it also has alternative parts for this option is to build a B Mark 14. Now it doesn't state it on the box um, initially on the front but it, there it's on the back of the box and it's also on later boxings. The actual kit I've got is one of the original issues if, from 1976. This is the first release um, of the Wellington from Matchbox. It was released in 1976 as we said and the way you can tell an initial release boxing is that the sky behind the upper image of the Wellington there, you can see it, is actually quite dark. It's quite dark, bluey grey. Um, all of the other boxings, that is very much whiter. And so you know if you have an initial um, release, like I think they were released on Type 3 boxes actually, they were open-ended. They weren't a flip-top lid like the you know the early rendition purple range, but they were open-ended boxes. And the red range started in 1976. Um, and this is PK402. Interesting thing to note is that you have <clears throat> Wellington Mark 10 with three alternative squadron decals in white, with a red uh, disc with 172nd scale kit written on it. Three colour kit logo here in the bottom left hand corner, and here in the bottom right hand corner, you have the word marquee, which I think is French for model, or is that mob moduit marquee? I think might it might be, um, it's something to do with models in French anyway. Um, and that's how you can tell an original release Wellington, um, on the original release boxing. So, 1976 kit was released that year. Then in 1979, here you have the second release boxing of the Wellington. You can see that the background sky is quite a lot lighter white. It's it's almost white, actually. And the Wellington, um, the name Wellington and Mark 10 have gone from white to black and blue. And then you have a little bit of, um, a little bit of, um, Information on the aircraft itself, World War II bomber of geodetic construction and a three colour kit, 172nd scale model kit written there. And the word marquee is still here in the bottom right hand corner. But the three colour kit logo that was on the first release boxing has disappeared. And it's been introduced into this section of writing here at the, at the bottom underneath Wellington B Mark 10. Now then, um, 1979 was shared by an American agent release boxings. It's exactly the same kit, but the thing that's interesting about the American agent AMT is I think AMT was an established agent for models in America at the time, and Matchbox um, I think used this agency to release kits in America for them on their behalf. Um, Matchbox and AMT sort of joined forces and they released an awful lot of Matchbox and AMT kits in America and in the United Kingdom, of which some were matchbox models and some were AMT kits, but this is the first boxing um, which mentions the fact that the Wellington is offered in a B Mark 14 as well. Um, <clears throat> and then when I show you the back of this box that I've got here, it's quite an interesting option, the B Mark 14, because it's quite a vast difference in colour camo pattern. Um, and I am sort of tempted to build it, even though it doesn't have a forward turret which is interesting, but that's the AMT release, the American Agent release, which was co-released at the same time in 1979 to the second boxing of the Matchbox kit. In 1989, the kit was released in its final original Matchbox form boxing. Um, it was virtually a carbon copy of the second release box, uh, but the blue 
Mark 10 and the blue writing for World War II Bomber of Geodetic Construction and Three Colour Stroke Blah 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 model, Scale Model Kit um, is in a sort of a softer blue. It's not such a stark blue colour. It's more of a REF blue, if you like. And the word marquee appears to be slightly more embossed in in font. It's um, it's slightly different, but this box is actually quite rare to get hold of. Um, I've never seen um, this style release from 1989, and the way you can tell it's an 89 release is because it has A+, plus, which was the age range that they were trying to aim at, 8 to about 18 year old. Um, and that's the third release boxing from Matchbox, and it has 8 plus in the top right hand corner there. And that's how you can tell it's a very rare offering box from Matchbox of the Wellington Mark 10. Now, 1989 went through to 1992, and something happened with Matchbox kits in the early 90s. They were actually taken over and marketed by Ravel. Ravel bought the marketing rights for Matchbox models, and I think it was a precursor to them taking over Matchbox as a company lock, stock and barrel. Um, but something drastically changed to Matchbox kits at around about 1992-1993, in that the multicolour sprues now became one colour. Now, I can't remember what the colour was that was used on this particular model, but I've got a feeling it could have been black, but it could also have been green. I can't remember... Uh, maybe somebody out there has knowledge of this boxing's uh, colours for sprues. It would be quite nice to know. Um, the B Mark 10 stroke B Mark 14 is featured on the black border around the outside of the artwork. And the artwork was drastically changed um, from the original releases. But it's the same kit inside. Um, I don't think it's the same markings, but it's the same kit inside. Um, actually, EBH. No, sorry, it's the same markings. EBH was the second option of B Mark 10. So it probably is exactly the same kit with the same markings inside, but they also changed the number, um, the serial number of the kit from PK402 to 40402. Re, re, uh, like keeping in the PK402 number in their original serial number, but it's uh, it was changed to 40402. And uh, the black border is a big giveaway for the Ravel marketed kits, and they didn't have the multiple coloured sprues inside. They're, they're all one colour. So 1992 gave way to the actual Ravel release of the Matchbox kit in Ravel boxings. Now this does have alternative markings for a Royal Australian Air Force aircraft. I'm not sure what option the the Mark 14 is. It's probably the same Coastal Command option, um, and. I'm not sure whether I like the artwork on this. It just doesn't look as good as the original artwork. Um, it doesn't even look as good as the original marketed, Ravel marketed Matchbox kit artwork either. Uh, but the kit was released on a serial number 04601 in 2002. And I believe you can still get this model on open release. You should probably find it in the shops from time to time. But they don't tend to have it on permanent production all the time. Um, so that's the Ravel release, 2002, and that was the final release of the original Matchbox kit of the Wellington B Mark 10 stroke B Mark 14. We'll leave you a nice image here, which is actually quite poignant, because this is actually an Australian Air Force B Mark 14. And straight away you can tell the major difference between this aircraft is that it has two blisters, one under the fuselage, directly behind the leading edge of the wings there, which is a, a small part, uh, I think it's some sort of search radar, but that is actually featured in the B-Mark 14 Matchbox kit. You can have that as a separate part added to the kit. And also the chin turret with the radar equipped underneath that dome. Um, in this case, it's, it actually features a machine gun, but in the Matchbox kit, it's just a plain dome. There's no guns in that um, that dome whatsoever. But this kit can be, this aircraft can be modelled from the Matchbox kit. The parts are there quite easily. You could probably use uh, the machine gun that comes with the turret of the uh, B Mark 10 and just put the two holes in the glazing before you paint over that because um, I'm pretty sure that um, there's a frame that goes into the intersection section where the holes are for that dome. So you should be able to put two holes in that and then paint the frame in. That's the B Mark 14. We'll just pan the camera down now so that you can have a good look at this kit. It is quite an interesting boxing, but um, I've got a little bit of a, <clears throat> a confession to make because I didn't buy this untouched. It is actually a kit that needs some TLC, 
but it's not been extensively started as you'll see in a minute apart from the removal of two propellers from the sprue and a bit of paint here and there of small parts in the interior of the fuselage this kit is pretty much untouched but before actually before I open the box there's a few things I want to show you on the box itself but um, the one thing I do want to say is that the Matchbox Wellington does have a couple of issues about it that I am a bit surprised about um, but we'll get to those when we have a look at the parts now on the end of the box <clears throat> you've got PK402 Wellington B Mark 10 then you've got the Matchbox logo on the right hand side with the artwork repeated and three colour kit 172nd scale aircraft in the red range disc this shows you it's a red range. Now the Wellington was the second kit released in the red range, the first being the Heinkel HE 115 float plane. And on the back of the other side, it's exactly the same. It's been uh, repeated again. Now on this side of the box, you've got an image of the Wellington, what it looks like when it's built up unpainted. And these are the three colours the kit's built in. It's built in brown, green and black sprue under under the side of the surfaces so you know it's another case where um matchbox have tried to render the kit in colors which make it look sort of like it would have done when it was in operational service and matchbox tended to do this quite a lot the other interesting thing on this side of the panel is that you have pk401 which is the heinkel float plane and pk403 the Wellington being 402, which is the 403 is the Heinkel HE 111. Now this is a kit that I'm actually trying to get hold of to do an inbox review, full build and progress video because I, I remember building this kit when I was a teenager and it's actually quite a nice model to build. It's basic inside again, like all Matchbox kits are, they're basic, you know, everyone knows that. But it is actually quite an accurate Heinkel. It's quite a nice and enjoyable build and I think the nostalgia value of building that kit would be well worth getting hold of them. The problem with the HE111 is it t tends to fetch ridiculous money. And I don't know why, because mind you, the Red Rangers do. They do tend to fetch quite a lot of cash for what they are, you know. Let's try and get this kit out of the box. I just want to make sure I've got everything out. There's two propellers which come off sprue there. There's nothing else in there. No. So I'll just put this box down here. Um, out of the way for now and we'll have a look um, at the instruction leaflet now the instruction leaflet is quite interesting it folds up into an a4 sized instruction leaflet and as a lot of people know about any experience of matchbox kits whatever range the kit is in in this case it's the red range the instruction leaflet on the original early release boxings this is the first and second generation release boxings they tended to have the colour of the range instruction leaflet, so in this case it would be red. But after the second release kits, they tended to merge into all white instruction leaflets for all of their ranges, and I think that was just to ease manufacture of the instruction uh, leaflets that went in all of their kits. Now, it unfolds into a piece of paper that's about A3. It's quite a large instruction leaflet, and the kit builds up in 10 sections. But on the back, I just want to quickly show you this. On the back here, you've got some paint instructions in different languages. And then you've got the IDs for the paint numbers. Now, these are paint numbers, I think, which were uh, Matchbox paints or, ma or paints range used by Matchbox. But I don't think they're Humbrol colours, HB1 and HB2 and so on and so on. They're definitely not Humbrol colours. But you can actually in some cases get uh, a merge over from Humbrol to Airfix colours. 61 there, matte flesh, is actually M7. Um, so and G, the fire bronze colour there is actually G15. And they're actually Airfix colour paints. And you can get a... Um, you can actually go online and get the conversion colours for any, any paint range and convert it into Humbrol Tamiya. It's not an issue. And then on the bottom of this page, you've got lots, I'll just pull it out a little bit so you can see, you've got lots of photo, uh, lots of pictorial images here that show you what colours to paint this model's parts prior to final assembly. So when you're building the kit throughout, it will just tell you, you know, paint the pilot these colours, the interior, the back of the turrets, the engines, everything. It tells you exactly what colours they suggest to paint the kit before you assemble each section, which is quite nice. And also, this is something I've never noticed before, but it's quite interesting. On the left-hand top corner of this instruction leaflet, you've got a full list 
of the Matchbox Purple range, the Matchbox Purple range 76 scale, that's the armour kits, the orange range, and the red range. And you can see the extent of the actual kits that are there. The blue range is the cars. I've actually bought a couple of those. Um, well, I've definitely got one and waiting for a second one to turn up. Um, and they're quite an interesting option as well because they had metallized chrome parts, which was quite nice. Um, we'll just open the uh, instruction leaflet up. But before I do, you've got a, a plan here on the back page that shows you how to assemble the multi-positional stand. Now, the multi-positional stand in this kit has actually got a part missing which renders a stand absolutely useless because the multiple position part, the, the, the clip that goes over the ball joint at the top of the shaft is actually missing and I don't know where it is. So the, the stand is actually useless. It's probably chuck away fodder. But to be honest with you, the matchbox stands, the airfix stands and some of the frog stands are actually very marketable. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised to get something like 150 250 for each one on eBay. They seem to be quite marketable indeed and collectible. Now then, I'm not going to go fedantically through these instructions because they're very, very easy to follow. But what I'm going to do, I'm just going to pan over the instructions so you can see exactly what the method of construction on this kit is. Section 1, you're basically building the interior and the pilots. Um, section 2 and 3, you're basically building the rear and the forward gun turrets for the B-Mark 10. Um, and the rear turret obviously features in the B-Mark 14. In section 4, You've got the windows that go into the fuselage and the fuselage assembly. That's quite easy. This that part there, part 77, is that actual, the little, um, it's like a search radar, possibly um, some sort of magnetic anomaly thing. But it is part avionics and it's only featured on the B Mark 14. Section 5, you're putting the, uh, the forward gun turret into the B10. Or you have alternative parts there, 78 and 79, for the B Mark 14. Now, the B Mark 14 was a dedicated maritime re um, reconnaissance aircraft and bomber. It actually carried quite a lot of sonar boys, uh, torpedoes, uh, quite a lot of uh, anti shipping um, equipment which was, and munitions, which was quite useful. And it was responsible for sinking quite a number of U boats in the Mediterranean. You've got the canopy fit and various avionics and the Astrodome part 76 there. That's a transparency as well. And then in section six, you just build in the undercarriage oleos and main wheels. Section seven, you're building the engines. Can't remember what engines are in this aircraft, but some of the Wellingtons were actually powered by Hercules later in their life. And I think the B-10 was a, Her a Hercules powered aircraft. Section eight, you're building the tailplanes. It's very easy to follow, isn't it? The, the undercarriage fits into the lower nacelles there, you can see that, and um, they just clip into place. But they're, I think they're optional position. I think you glue them into that position. But basically, section nine, you're, you're putting the wings together and assembling them to the airframe and then putting the engine nacelles and the engines together and uh, assembling the majority of the airframe. That's that done and dusted. And then in section 10, you've got the undercarriage doors, the various exhaust pipes and the tailwheel. And then you've got an option there to having the undercarriage in the raised position. And the interesting thing about the Wellington is that in the raised positions, its wheels were still partially um, open to the elements. So that's basically the build method. It's quite easy. The instructions are very easy to follow um, and explains everything very well indeed. Now, I'll just show you this multiple position stand. On the red range, they were quite large. Um, and these, if you've got one complete, this this one actually is supposed to have a, a runner here with the, the little cap that goes over the top of that ball shaft. Unfortunately, it's missing. So this stand is actually pretty much useless and it will probably be bin fodder. But you never know. I might pop, pop it on eBay and see if I can get 50p or something for it. They, they're very marketable indeed. And if somebody's got one of those ball joint caps that go over the top, it will be a nice stand. It's quite sizable and it's got Matchbox written on it there. Quite nice. And Lin Lesney Production and Company Limited on that side there. That's quite nice. So these, these are quite marketable and they, they should be, you know, looked after or used. I think they're quite, they're quite good stands. Now the decals. There's only a couple of things I want to say about Matchbox decals. Let's have a quick look at them. 
The Matchbox decals, they're sort of okay. I don't want to take the dust sheet off this too much, but the, the quality of the decals is actually quite good. And the thing about Matchbox decals is that I don't know why it is, but they seem to have longevity and usability about them, even though they're from the 70s. These decals, I have no doubt that they will go on, they'll lie perfectly, and their backing sheen will be pretty much invisible. They're actually very, very good decals. The only issue I have with this particular sheet is the register on the side roundels that go on the side of the fuselage there isn't that good. The red dot is slightly to one side, or maybe it's the, the white ring that it sits on isn't quite centralised. And that's a shame, really, because, um, yeah, that's, that's a bit of a shame. But these decals, they do last the test, you know, they, they last the test of time and they, they're perfectly usable. Now then, transparencies. <clears throat> the transparency on the Matchbox kits, they tend to be pretty good quality. They tend to be pretty clear. And this one is no exception, as you can see. The, the, uh, the canopy cover there is really, it's crystal clear. The framework on it, the quality of the mouldings, it's actually really good. And that's the same with all the turrets um, and all the windows there with the geodetic design. You'll have to paint that in. The geodetic design will show through, obviously. And then you've got the dome for the B Mark 14 there. And as you can see, there's no machine gun holes in the front of that. But you could put two in and put the machine guns that are supposed to be for the B10 into the front of there. Now, the other thing I wanted to point out is that the shape of the rear turret on the Matchbox kit is actually quite flat at the front. Now, I've built the Airfix Wellington B3, which was actually an earlier release. I think the Wellington from Airfix was the first Wellington model on the market and anywhere in the world. And the turret on the, the rear turret on that kit, compared with that, is appalling. In actual fact, the Airfix B3 is pretty bad. It's not a, it's not a good rendition of the air, aircraft at all. But they have re-released a new version of the Wellington, and it's, um, that's worth looking at. Now then, the black sprue first, we'll have a look at this. We've got a couple of propellers that are off sprue. As I said before, this kit has been started, but only really with a bit of paint, and the guys painted these propellers up, and I must admit they're probably going to need redoing because they're not a very good job, but the props themselves, they're a nice shape, aren't they? The Airfix Wellington propellers were nothing like that. They're almost paddle-bladed propellers. They're really quite nicely shaped. I like the look of those, but they will need painting probably in semi-gloss black. The black sprue itself, I have, a, I have this feeling that, that, that this kit is a little bit of a mixed bag, which is a bit of a shame. It, it is a bit of a mi mixed bag, unfortunately. The, uh, the parts are quite crisply moulded, as with most Matchbox models. There's very little flash. In actual fact, I can't see any flash on this sprue at all. I can't see any flash on virtually any of the sprues in this model. And it does have quite some nice surface detail but the geodetic detail on the wings and the tail planes is pretty much uniform like this it's not uniform throughout the part and i'm quite disappointed about that because as you can see further down the wingtip here the geodetic design loses some of its definition and i don't think it should have done that um, it's not so apparent on the tail planes um, they're gonna have to be cleaned up a little bit <laughs> But uh, they are they are a bit unfortunate in being not as uniform as I would like. The wheel design, as you can see there, the wheels they're quite nicely moulded, aren't they? They will, of course, have to be repainted because I don't know of an RAF bomber that had chrome silver wheel hubs on a bomber at all. They were all generally matte black um, with tyre black tyres. So that's that sprue there. The second sprue we'll look at is the green one. Again, there's a couple of uh, bits there painted matte black, the guns mainly, but I generally paint my guns semi-gloss black, 85 Humbrol coat. Um, and again, you've got an issue here with the geodetic design on that wing. You can see that it's not as uniform as it should be. It should be a little bit... I would say it's about the right amount of pronouncedness. It's about the right sort of effect that you should have, but it should be more uniform than that. It's more apparent on the other wing. The other wing is... Yeah, it should be definitely more regimental than that. The tail planes, you can see them on the tail planes. They don't seem to be as uniform as I would like them to be. The engine nacelles are quite nice. They're quite nicely moulded. And also the engine cowlings, they're quite nicely moulded as well. They look quite nice. 
and these two guys here that pilot the aircraft. There's quite a lot of my subbers who really like Matchbox pilots. Um, and I wouldn't say I don't like them. I, I sort of do like them, but I, I prefer the Airfix pilots. I think the Airfix pilots look a little bit more relaxed in their seat, more professional, if you know what I mean. But these guys do, if I can bring that to the camera a bit better, these guys, they, they do paint up quite nicely. And they do look the part. They look okay. So that's the green sprue. <clears throat> then we'll look at the brown sprue. Well, a part come off sprue on this one, one of the fuselage halves. Um, the parts on this kit don't look too bad. The engines there are quite nicely defined. They'll paint up quite nice. He has, of course, painted the gearbox totally the wrong colour, which is a shame. But uh, it's not it's not something you can't fix. The back of the turret has some lines there defined. Quite nice. The exhaust the exhausts have been painted the wrong colours, which is a shame. You've got the B-Mark 10 uh, twin parts there for the underside of the nose, and the B-Mark 14 the single part with the chin, chin uh, radar. That's quite nicely moulded as well. And on the inside, the guy's painted the interior zinc chromate quite nicely, hasn't he? It's not a bad finish, actually. But I'll show you the fuselage half a bit better on this side, because this side's come off sprue. Absolutely no detail in interior whatsoever, but this was common in matchbox kits. They... They were reputed to be very basic, but their fit and engineering of fit is superb. They usually fit together really well, and again, there's no sprue on any of, uh, no flash or burr on any of these parts, and the abnormality of the plastic is virtually non-existent. The, the plastic parts are uh, beautifully cast, um, <clears throat> but the airframe is a sort of a mixed bag of raised and recessed detail. Most of the panel lines are raised. The embossed ray, uh, rudder there is the, the line going up and the, the trim tab on the rudder is recessed. Um, and there is a little bit of raised ribbing going on down here. The runners are formed here. But I do think that that could have been better done because this aircraft is supposed to be geodetic design throughout its airframe. And there's no sign of any of the geodetic features on that fuselage half it's just runners isn't it but the Wellington one of the things a lot of people don't realize is that the Wellington was actually covered the entire airframe was covered in fabric and doped up it wasn't a stressed metal bomber it was coated in in fabric and dope so that's the part <clears throat> quite easy to uh, to follow what I want to do now I'll just leave you an image of the the box you can have a look at the box there it is whilst I go through the the technical gump on this video and try and close this video down. Now then, the model we're in box reviewing is actually a Matchbox Vickers Wellington B Mark 10 stroke 14. Its release date was 1976 and it carries a serial number of PK402, which makes it part of the red range. It's moulded in 172nd scale and the kit's dimensions are approximately 11 inches long by 13 inches in span and it should sit about 3 inches high on its undercarriage. Now there are 32 parts on one black plastic sprue, 16 parts on one brown plastic sprue, 19 parts on a green plastic sprue, and 12 parts on one clear plastic sprue, totaling 79 parts in total. Now there are decals for three versions. There's a Wellington Mark 10 of number 428 Ghost Squadron Royal Canadian Air Force, based at Dalton in Yorkshire, circa, 19, eight, sorry, circa April 1943. There's a Wellington B Mark 14 of Numbers 179 Squadron Royal Air Force Coastal Command, and this aircraft was based at Gibraltar in 1943. And the third option is a Wellington B Mark 10 of Numbers 300 Polish Squadron, based at RAF Hemswell in Lincolnshire, circa March 1943. Now, the options and costs there are quite a few options and costs, but not an awful lot of standalone moulds. Um, and I'll go through the standalone moulds and We'll go through the recommended kits um, in the conclusions. In 172nd scale, the standalone models were the original release, 1950s, late 1950s Airfix Wellington B3. This kit retails for about £9.50 to 40 quid, depending on the quality and age and the greed of the seller who's trying to sell it. They also released um, a new tool, Airfix Wellington B Mark 1C in 2018 and this kit retails for around about 18 to 34 pound again depending on whether the guy wants a lot of money for it or not 
Now, there were a couple of models that were released in the 40s, um, around about 1944, 46. One of them was from Comet, uh, no pricings on that, and the other one was from Megal, no pricings on those two, but they're probably in excess of 100 quid because they'll be incredibly rare. Frog also released a Wellington B Mark 1C, and that model I've seen sell once in nine, uh, for about £56 a couple of years ago on eBay. The Matchbox Wellington B10 and B14 retails for anything between £9 and £30. The MPM Productions Wellington B Mark 1C and B Mark 2, B Mark 3, B Mark 4, B Mark 8 and B Mark 10 um, retails for between £14 and £32 and each version of the Wellington is a different boxing. The Trumpeter Wellington B Mark 1C stroke 3 and they did a B Mark 10 and a B Mark 14. Those kits retail for about £15 to £34. Now, there was quite a lot of reboxing of other people's kits. Airfix released a Wellington B Mark 1C, which was actually a reboxed MPM kit, and that retailed for about £8 to £16. Airfix Corporation of America released the original Tool B3, and that retails for £10 to £40. Airfix by Craftmaster also reboxed the Wellington B Mark III kit for about £5 to £30. Alanga produced the Wellington B Mark 1C, which was a reboxed frog kit, for about £25 to £40. Now, Amco, American model craft company, they did a Wellington, which was actually the Comet kit from the 40s. Uh, again, no pricing on that. And Donetsk Toy Factory produced a Wellington B Mark 1C, which was actually a reboxed frog kit. Again, no pricing on that. Eastern Express did a Wellington B Mark 1C which was a reboxed frog kit for about £15 to £16. And Intec also re-released the frog kit B Mark 1C, but no pricing on that. Italieri do a Wellington B Mark 1C and a 10, which was the MPM kit, for about £10 to £17. Mackey did a Wellington B Mark 1C, which was the frog kit, for about £13 to £14. Matchbox AMT produced the Wellington B10 and B14, which was the Matchbox reboxed kit. No pricings on that. Modelcraft did a Wellington B Mark II, which was the frog kit with resin cast engines and nacelles. The B Mark II was actually the Merlin engine powered Wellington. Again, I've got no pricings on that, but it is available and it does crop up here and there. MPC did a Wellington B Mark III, which was the original Airfix B3 reboxed for £10 to £20. Novo did the Wellington B Mark 1C, which was an ex frog kit, no pricings on that. Ravel produced a Wellington B Mark II, which was an MPM kit, £8. Um, Ravel also produced the Wellington B10 and B Mark 14, which was a reboxed frog kit for £13. C Merge did a Wellington B Mark 1C, which was a reboxed frog kit, again, no pricings on that. And Tasha Grushka Hobby Holding Limited did a Wellington B Mark 1C, which was actually the reboxed frog kit, and again, I've got no pricings on that. Now then, conclusions. I didn't want to study larger scales for this review, view, so I'm only really concentrating on 70-second scale kits. The Matchbox kit is revived by Pro... Uh, sorry, is... Um, it's praised relatively well by Pro Builders as being a kit with no fit issues. Uh, and it has limited detail, but it's, it's common to all Matchbox models. But that isn't really the reason why people build Matchbox kits anymore. They bring back childhood memories and the nostalgia alone makes the build worth the time. However, this kit is not that bad with options to build the Mark 10 and 14 and the airframe appears to be fairly accurate. The geodetic detail on the wings and the tailplane appears to be erratic, which is really the only fault I have with this model. The transparencies are crystal clear and seem to be of a good shape too. I think the best options for a 70 second scale Wimpy would have to be the Airfix's new tool B Mark 1C. The MPM boxings and the trumpeter kits are pretty good too, but avoid the frog-based models and the early issue Airfix B Mark III based kits, as they are really dire. That's the uh, inbox review finished for the uh, the Matchbox Wellington B Mark X. I hope this video has been of some use. Um, if there's any questions, any comments, any information that you want to add, just pop them in the comments slip. Any questions, I'll try and get back to you with an answer as quickly as possible. Um, may all your projects go smooth and just enjoy what you're doing out there. Thanks for watching. Bye bye for now.